But those functional responsibilities are going to be there. How do I hire more capacity? You'd still be making the same money and have openings now. How do I improve process flow? 20 to 25% were these much more profitable, four, five times more revenue. All these are things that have us think about the business differently. Like if I'm not doing the business, which I really enjoy, who am I without the business? Maui Mastermind presents the Business Coach Podcast, answering your questions and providing real actionable insights for building a better, stronger, more profitable business without sacrificing your time, life, or freedom anymore. Well, welcome to this episode of the Business Coach Today I want to talk about what is it that keeps business owners trapped. Specifically, I want to be talking in here today about um, what I consider to be the five pitfalls that keep you or any business owner trapped in your business. Really, I want you to leave here today understanding the root causes of what is owner reliance in a business so that you can avoid or sidestep these um, five pitfalls and you can be much, much better, faster to grow your company to become an owner independent level three company, a company that really is ready for whatever that next stage or step is for an exit. Sell it, own it passively, or continue to scale to take it to a magnitude larger. So as we go through it today, um, I wanna give a quick overview. What are these five pitfalls? I'm gonna go into detail what each of these pitfalls are, and I'll give you examples, case studies about how to sidestep them. We don't even realize how many business owners, I think, and, and again, this has been experiences of coaching 10,000 business owners over the last 27, 28 years. And what I see is that many of them don't even realize that the way that they run their business, the way they think about their business, the way they operate their business, it guarantees that that business is rooted in, addicted to their presence, that without their presence, that business would fail. And yet the movement away to create a true owner-independent business, which is not an all-or-nothing thing, it's a, it's a little bit of a, a, of a chicken and egg thing where you do some and it gets better than some. It's more of a progression versus a either or. But when you do that, here's the ultimate irony. Life is so much easier. It takes less work when you make the business work more versus you personally trying to produce. All right, so five pitfalls. Here's what they are. I'm going to give you it as an overview. First of all, first pitfall, the capacity barrier. The capacity barrier comes when you personally have no more time in the business. You don't have the, the ability as a company to handle more, more business for your product or service. Second pitfall is controlitis, the inflammation of your control gland. Um, I have a lot of medical groups that we coach, and I've asked them, hey, where in the body, when you studied in medical school, the physiology, where in the body is the control gland? And uh, you know, people laugh. I've had one person once went like this with his hands, as if it's the, the, the part of him, the sticky fingers that can't let go. But controlitis traps so many business owners. Next, the leadership bottleneck. So many businesses are built reliant on the owner to be the main leader. Next, the revenue paradox. Hey, David, I, I love this idea of owner independence, but my company needs my production for revenue. I, I, I need to work with clients. I, I need to oversee in some fashion production. Why? Without that, we, we wouldn't have the revenue and, and we couldn't afford the cash flow to keep growing. And then five, fifth is what I'll call the identity crisis. I'll leave that for a surprise at the end. You're going to hear that at the end, and the first comment you're going to have is, no, that can't be true. And the second comment you're going to say is, oh, it must be, must be nice when you have that problem. And the third transition you're going to have when you hear what the identity crisis is, you're going to go, you know what? Man, that really makes sense. I wish I, wish I would have known that before. <laughs> so let's start off with the capacity barrier. So pitfall number one, capacity barrier. Specifically what this means is you're so busy as a company handling the business that you currently have that you don't have the room, you don't have the capacity to take on more customers, more clients, more projects. You just don't. And I see this all the time with middle stage level two businesses that have grown and starting to make that transition into advanced stage level two. And you know, when you think about it, remember three levels to a business, level one, level two, level three. Level one is a startup. Level two has early, middle, and advanced stage. Early stage level two is that business where it is just out of the gates. It has not yet reached the point of consistent profitability. It's starting to find those early customers and clients to produce those early jobs. Middle stage level two is that prototypical owner-reliant company. It works because the whole business revolves around the owner. Um, it's profitable. It's durable, we think, profitable. It's been profitable for over a year. 
advanced stage level two says, hey, we're now starting to build out the systems, the team, and control such that the business is starting to have a life beyond just the owner, scaling beyond the owner. And this rapid growth company typically will have leaders other than the owner leading one or two of the five pillars of the company. Now, we talk about the five pillars, sales, marketing, operations, executive leadership, HR team, and then financial. Many companies will break sales and marketing into two functions. We do that internally for Maui Mastermind. Other businesses will take um, the operations and break that into administrative and production, um, for example. Wonderful. But those functional responsibilities are going to be there. As you grow from middle stage into advanced stage level two, the capacity barrier comes up. You're so busy producing, producing, especially because the owner is one of the main points of production. I'm going to give a couple examples from this. I think the easiest way is to do it with a couple stories here. So first story I want to share with you, this is Tom uh, and Chad, two coaching clients, both own medical practices. That's funny. I didn't realize I was going to tell you the story of Tom, but I'm, I'm laughing and smiling because he's actually standing here in this picture um, out at our Hawaii our annual business success summit event we do every year in Hawaii. Tom has been now, I think, eight times. Chad is coming back for his fourth time, I believe, this year with his wife, Lindsay. But let's talk about Tom for a moment. So part of being a business owner is we've got to upgrade how we run the business. And I'm going to give an example of what that might look like. So let's go back to, to Tom for a moment here. When Tom first started with us, he's a surgeon. And you think about that, surgeon was all based on his personal production in the company, his production. So here he is, a surgeon. And so he would spend two days per week doing what he called his procedure days. I'll call it OR, his procedures. And then he would spend three days per week doing what I'll call clinic you know, visiting with patients, pre and post op, seeing new patients, etc. And then you'd say, well, David, when did he actually run the business? Well, at night, <laughs> he would spend about three to four hours per week, quote unquote, running the business. Now, he had the advantage that his wife, Holly, was running his front office. <laughs> she was uh, playing the role of a practice manager. She, she was doing it reluctantly. She did not want to do that. That was not her passion. But the business needed it and her husband needed her. And so she stepped up. That was great. So now Tom's saying, well, look, these three clinic days feed these OR days. And the OR days, the, the procedural time, is where he makes his income. And if you think about it, he would start his procedures at 7 a.m., and he would go all the way through to about 4 o'clock. And he'd have a short break for a meal and lunch, but he would pack in. His way of growing the company was to get so good, he could fit in more and more and more procedures. Where another surgeon could maybe do half or a quarter of his volume, he got so good at the procedures he was expert in. He could do what other people did in an hour. He could do it in 15, 20 minutes. And so he had his crew running two different side-by-side -side operating rooms. That was the way he sped up production. But, but think about what that means. That's why I kind of have the pictures here of two different OR rooms. There is a point that he's not going to be able to produce past. And he had reached the point that he was so full doing that. So we talked with him and gave him the coaching. First of all, we broke down what he was doing. What he discovered was that during this part here, he had round numbers about 20 to 25% of his patients that he did procedures on were really high profitable um, payers. What that meant was based on who was paying for the procedure, for the same procedure, he got paid typically anywhere from four to five times more than his lowest paying types of insurance payers that he had on there. And what was strange was that he wouldn't even realize it, that roughly 50% of his volume were these low paying patients. Now, Again, I'm not going to get into the ethical component of that. I understand. Um, but for him, he, he couldn't do more procedural stuff. He was already working 60, 70 hours in a week. Typically, 60, 65 would be a common week for him. He was already doing more procedures than he, than he could possibly do or someone else could even do. And so what our comment was, well, what if you took, as a starting point, reduce this 50% down to 25%? And by doing that, he just freed up. 25% more capacity. Now, here's the cool part. Let's just do some simple math. If he filled even just half of that filled up capacity with more of these higher paying 
payers, he would still be working 10, 15% less and be earning 10 or 15% more. The math doesn't work exactly that way, but it's pretty darn close. What that means is, remember, they're paying four to five times more for the same slot. So by getting rid of some of these red and putting more of the green, he has increased capacity and he's making more money, which seems impossible. The key is, though, he's running his different business better, differently. You know, running your business at night for three or four hours a week, what that meant was he wasn't really running the business. He was just keeping it moving forward. He just didn't even take the time to think about it. Now, the first time we challenged him about this, his first response was, well, I, that makes sense in theory, but in practice, you know, what if I don't replace these people? What if I don't get more? You know, what if I have empty slots? What if I... And we just put out there to him saying, look, you know, you don't need to replace all of them. You, you've, you've got a waiting list that's close to two months out. You're going to replace, even if you don't replace, even if you only replaced 20 to 25% of this half, you'd still be making the same money and have openings now for another 25, 30% more capacity. It's a huge deal. I'll give another example here. Um, another example will be for a professional services firm. One of the accounting firms that we work with, um, the guy who owned the business and we coached him, he was a tremendously nice man. He had been in the world of public accounting for, oh gosh, probably 20 years by this point. Um, he started off with one of the big accounting firms and he went off on his own. His family told him, he's crazy, you're nuts, you're leaving, you know, what essentially is a partnership track at one of the big, at that time was the big five. Um, now I believe it's the big three. <laughs> but... Uh, he just wanted to be his own, he wanted to be his own boss. He wanted to, to build something. He had that entrepreneurial drive. Isn't that wonderful? So here's what we said to him. We said, look, his biggest challenge was he couldn't take on more tax and or financial write-up work. If here's where capacity was for him, if this was his 100% capacity, his business was flirting with at various times just right here over the edge. And as a result, he was at... His staff was stressed out. They couldn't produce more. And the way that they produced, though, was the challenge. He couldn't see it because he was so wrapped into it that any professional services firm, like let's take the example of doing tax preparation, tax strategy, or prep. You know, this work has um, you know, probably anywhere from 20 to as much as 50% of this work, if you look at it as a pyramid, 20 to 50% of this work has an element of administration, uh, follow-up, organizing, sending information back and forth. You know, probably in his business, that would be at least 25 to 30 percent. That could be done as what I'll call an admin. That admin is going to be there to schedule appointments, to make sure you get the raw, you know, the K-1s and the 1099s and the W-2s together, to make sure that, um, um, you know, tax returns through the, the, the signature portal get sent out the right way. Then on top of that, though, you're going to have probably what I'll call the next 30 to 40 percent. What I'll call, this is going to be what I'll call an expert. This, in this case, would be the CPA doing the tax work itself. The person is that, that understands the tax law and actually can get, you know, to do the calculations in the software to get the tax returns prepared. You know, how do we deal with the accelerated depreciation? How do we deal with our IC disc company for our overseas sales of products? How do we deal with, and the list goes on and on. And then on top of that, there's this magic probably less than 5%, which is all called the world-class expert. And this really, in this case, was the owner of this CPA firm. And what he was doing, though, is he was having his tax people taking on way too much of this middle ground section here that an admin can do. So his first step to free up capacity was to have more of the process that could be done at an admin level versus an expert, in this case, the CPA level, having that happen, which expanded his capacity 20, 30% by doing that. And then when you do that, next you start saying, well, how do I hire more capacity, right? How do I improve process flow? All these are things that have us think about the business differently. Right? All right, next one I want to go in here. That's capacity barrier. Second one, oh, I can't stand this one. This one drives me crazy. I see it all the time with clients. The control-itis. 
This is the owner that is so wrapped into making sure that they stay in control that they can't let go. And, you know, I need to, to confession time. Um, I am probably one of the worst control freaks you will ever meet. Um, if my family were to hear this or my staff were to hear this, they would say, oh, well, yeah, duh, it's obvious. But uh, I don't come across that way all the time. But certainly if I'm around you enough, it's really hard for me to let go and let someone else do something because I see how to do it better, faster, with more impact. And the reality is much of what I see how to do better is just I see how to do it differently. And some of what I see that I could do better, it doesn't need to be better. Good enough is really good enough. Some areas of your business to satisfy is enough. The biggest thing, though, is what drives control itis is actually not necessarily the drive to make things better. It's the fear of being out of control, being helpless or powerless. That's what drives it. And so for me, I hate feeling that way, so I get involved. So what I've learned to do is when I can learn to grow my muscle to intelligently delegate and let go of control to other people. Notice that word intelligently. Not just to, to dump and run, not just to abdicate to somebody else, but to intelligently let go based on their proven ability, training and grooming along the way with internal controls that make sure that the right thing at the right time is happening. What that allows me to do is it allows me to have successes of handing things off. And the more successes I have of handing things off, it grows my capacity to hand off more. Now, I want to make a distinction between handing off a task, let's write this down here, handing off a task and handing off functional ownership of an ongoing responsibility. So some people want to delegate a task and they say, Julie, I'm asking for you to do X by this date and time this way versus, hey, Julie, you now own this responsibility. And it's not just this time, it's every time it happens, you're the one responsible. And if it ever gets, you get stuck in any case, you own coming to me to ask for help or guidance or, or for some coaching. Now, in addition to that, Julie, I'm still going to want you to make sure that you update on how this is going on a weekly basis through the, the weekly reporting process that we have, et cetera. But notice the difference, right? With one way, if something comes up that, that, that happens a second time and a third time, Julie's responsible time and time and again to be the one who owns that. The problem with delegating a task, which is faster, is it works the first time you get something you want, but then you're now having to send it a second time, and a third time, and a fourth time, and a fifth time, and a sixth time, and, and, and you keep having to delegate it. So one way to deal with that controlitis is, how can I delegate functional ownership of responsibility or part of responsibility to somebody else? and make them responsible. Here's the word I want you to write down, or term, it's called gap catcher. Make them responsible that they're the gap catcher. When something doesn't quite neatly fall in, they're responsible to handle it or to bring it up actively with you so you can help figure out with them what needs to happen. Versus otherwise, you're running around the business everywhere you can go, playing this role like, um, like I have a friend who has actually literally went to clown college. And he was a professional clown for a number of years, traveling with the circus. Um, do you ever remember they have these movies where they'd have the clowns and they would be holding like this net or a, a blanket underneath somebody high up and they would be running back and forth to make sure they could catch the person? I think that's like a lot of business owners, that they're running around there trying to catch anything that falls into the gaps. When you delegate functional ownership, somebody else plays that gap catcher role and your life becomes better and your business becomes more owner independent, less reliant on you. It's really important. Now, I will mention here, we have something we call the capability spectrum. When we talk about this with coaching clients, on a scale of one to 10, how has this person's demonstrated behavior, their track record shown how capable they are at this specific function on a scale of one to 10? If someone's a one or a two, you're not gonna give them ownership of a task of any consequence. If the stakes are high, they're not ready for it. If they're a five or a six, you might give them low stakes ta uh, tasks that they now own, or you might have them work with you as you do it enough to get them to a seven or an eight where they can really own that functional responsibility in a smarter way. So again, that word was how do I intelligently let go of control? I'm not asking for you to abdicate. I'm asking for you to do it intelligently. Um, and I want to bring up a point here, which is building strategic depth is what gives you the confidence 
to intelligently let go of control, if you can build strategic depth, and I'll come in and define this in a moment here, build out the systems, team, internal controls, the culture that says in our company, we always make sure that we have more than one party who can handle a particular function. If we can do that and let go of it intelligently, what that means is, is that our company is becoming less and less owner reliant and more and more owner independent. Strategic depth, we used to call it hit by the bus. You know, how do you make sure that you're safe if one of your key team members or you, the owner, get hit by the bus? I, I actually like the term. But then our company number two, who at the time was leading our operations pillar, her name is Teresa. She's now been with us for, I want to say, close to 15 years now. Um, she said, David, you know, the hit by the bus, it's a little bit morbid. It's a little bit too graphic. I used to have this picture that would show somebody literally in a caricature way getting hit at the front of the bus. And I thought, wow, this is great. And she said, no, it's a little bit much. Better than hit by the butts, let's talk about strategic depth. How do you build a business so that a team member could actually take a vacation without coming back to a mess? How do you build a business that if somebody were to leave the company, the rest of the people who are remaining behind don't feel like the company is going into chaos? How do you create a business where people have the opportunity to progress and grow, to have more impact? Strategic depth is a way that you do that. Now, Inside our coaching program, let me share with you a tool. We call it the strategic depth tool, but I, I want to focus here where it talks about systems, team, and culture. So strategic depth is the makeup of three different elements, systems, team, and culture. So systems mean the processes and procedures, the, the, the video that shows someone how to um, take in new client intake, the checklist that goes through um, how to make sure that, it, that uh, with a project, when we finish it off, we do these seven things that we check off, right? It might be a procedure written out. It might be a video. It might be a filled out template or an example. It might be um, a pre-done system such that it's a, an automatic drip email sequence that all clients get when they start with you. It might be, and the list goes on and on. The key is a system is where you're capturing the knowledge of how to perform a function in your business in such a way that it can be replicated again and again. It makes sure you control for quality. It gives you more capacity. It pushes down the level of skill it takes for someone to figure it out because it's a solved equation in your company. It's a really important thing. The second part are your cross-training of your team. So if I've got April and she's the only one who knows how to run payroll, I, I see this all the time. You know, um, business owners that we coach say, well, I can't, I can't, and if anything ever happened to April, I don't even know how to pay my people. I, I've never done payroll before. And I'm like, well, gosh, does April ever want to go on vacation? <laughs> Shouldn't somebody else know? Plus, doesn't it create a lot of like anxiety? Like I get worked up thinking that there's only one person in the business who knows how to do a crucial function. That's scary. Strategic Depth says that part of April's role is going to be to cross-train somebody else to be able to do that function, to document it and to cross-train somebody else so that she's got a backup. Now, the key part is, if you have a person, you might not be able to back up all of them in one person. You might say that April does 12 things that are really important for the company. Three of them are going to be backed up by John. Two of them, you're going to be the backup in the short run. Later on, we'll figure out somebody else. And then the other nine things, well, you're going to have to take time. And I'm going to ask a little bit off with that, but hey, um, we're doing it on the fly without a net. Where are my clowns running around with that uh, net underneath? The point I'm trying to share here with this, though, is I might not back up April with one person. It might be a multiple number of people. And I might never back up everything she does. But every key function that April does that I back up with, with good systems and a cross-trained team member, it reduces the reliance on just April for that one function. It lowers your risk of your company. It's a defensive move. And it also gives you a more stable, scalable platform to grow and expand. It's an offensive move. Strategic depth is really important. I want to give a couple more detailed pieces with this. So, you know, how do you do it? You build it bit by bit, quarter by quarter over time. Now, I want you to talk with your team. I want you to have an honest conversation with them. Hey, you know, April, in your area of the company and the financial pillar, what are the current vulnerabilities that, that right now, if you, um, you know, you had a family member that got ill or you suddenly needed to be away from the job for, for two weeks, four weeks, six weeks, what would be the most painful places? What would be the most costly places, the big vulnerabilities? Got it. Um, based on that part of it is, now I can do number two there and say, hmm, how good are we doing here, April? I can talk with her. Where, where are we capturing 
the processes for what you do. Where are we capturing how you're doing your, your monthly write-up side? How are we doing with, with how you're booking income and, 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 and revenue? How are we doing about where you're categorizing expenses? Do we need to cross-train somebody else with this part? And again, the way to frame this with your team member is to think about, look, April, we're going to be doing this across the business with all of our key people. And eventually, we're going to be doing this for every function and role because as we grow and scale the business, we've got to have strategic depth. You know, I want you and other team members to be able to take a vacation without freaking out that things are going to be a mess when you come back. Um, I want to make sure that you never have to worry if somebody were to need to leave for six or 12 weeks to take care of a family member. I want to make sure everyone else is still cared for so we can do work servicing clients and run the business like we need to. A part of that is every quarter we're going to pick one or two things in your area of the business and in my area of the business and also in Charles's area of the business that we can increase strategic depth a little bit that quarter. So for example, me this quarter, I'm working on how to cross train Joe on how to back up the scheduling process so that if I couldn't do the scheduling for our production team, he could in a pinch cover for me. I'm writing up the process. I'm using some past examples of past scheduling. I created the spreadsheet that I used with some training on a video. And then I'll be working with him and letting him do a few test runs. Not that he's going to take over it right now, but that just in case he's my backup. How about for you? If you could do one thing this quarter, what would be the one? And again, I just want each team member on the key roles to recognize, number one, that they're not the only ones doing it. Everyone that's important in the company is doing it, and eventually it'll be the whole company. Number two, I want them to recognize that I'm doing this too. Number three, notice how I frame that is that you know, I want you to be able to take a vacation or not worry that if somebody else needed to take a prolonged absence, that the company would still be able to do its role, that everyone would still have a livelihood, that it wouldn't hurt the business. We could still service our clients. We put it in the proper frame. What I don't want to do is I, I don't want to go to April and say, hey, April, um, if, I ever had a, if you ever quit or I ever fired you, I need to know how you do what you do. I mean, that's ridiculous. By the way, that's a very paranoid way of doing it. So I come at it with a more appropriate frame. Generally, the best thing I could tell you is start from the point of hire. If I'm interviewing April for, for a job with my company, hey, April, at our company, we believe in strategic depth. What that means is in this role, if you were to come on as our marketing lead, part of your function or your role would be to make sure you document and systematize how marketing is done at our company. So that number one, it's more scalable. Number two, that we always have multiple cross-trained team members who can handle things and cover for each other. And number three, that allows us to continue to grow and scale. We do this across our company. Is that something that you can buy into? Because if not, April, you can't work for our company. Right? In the interview stage, it is so easy. It's going to come right under the, the radar. And April's going to say, well, sure, that sounds smart. Matter of fact, I like that you do that because what that means is the business is being well run and I probably have some security or stability. Um, don't have to worry about the business going out of business. Right? So do it at the point of, of hire. If you can't do it in the interview part and with the onboard, then you're going to have to go back and, and kind of do what you didn't do before. So let's give a quick story about this. Um, this is Blake Schwank, an owner of an IT services company in Colorado. And Blake's actually one of our longest standing coaching clients. We've been working with him well over a decade now. We started, he was about, I don't know, uh, I want to say about half a million dollars a year in revenue. Um, it's more than 10x his company. But, but here's the point I want to make. So he started doing this work in about April, all the way back in 2009. That's when he started doing this work. And he had something happen. His number two person for the company, approximately one year later in 2010, his, his, be, his best number two person um, got recruited away to a company in California. Now, normally what would happen, if that had happened before we'd ever started doing this work, Blake had shared with me that, that his company would have been in chaos. Like they would not have been able to hand that well. It would have meant months of scrambling, Blake jumping in, other people trying to figure it out. You know, what are the clients that this guy worked with? Where were all the passwords kept? And what were the access points that needed to be done? And what were the services being provided? And, you know, how was the, their network mapped out? And the list goes on. But because it happened roughly a year later, he said it took us, it was a stressful 48-hour period. But within 48 hours, we were able to rearrange who was the tech responsible for all these different clients. 
We made sure that we had changed passwords and did all the other best practices to, to service our clients. And within 48 hours, we were back up and running in a way that it was stressful, but radically different than what it would have been if it had happened a year ago. So I want to just let you know this work, it, it's expensive in the sense of it takes some effort and energy. But not doing it is much more expensive in terms of energy and drama. So I like to think about it as how can I take an extra 5 maybe 10% along the way to build strategic depth? We're 90 to 95% still about growing and running the company. Now, depending on how mature the business is, sometimes that can go to 80 or 85% to the business and 10, 15, 20% into the strategic debt part. But generally, the proportion is going to be much more heavily in operating your business, which just takes a little bit of time and energy each quarter to build strategic depth. And over the course of one, two, five, seven years, you don't even recognize the company. The company is so much more stable and powerful. Um, so much more scalable as an owner independent business, which brings us to the next one here, pitfall number three that traps businesses and owner reliance, the leadership bottleneck. And so the easiest way to tell this one here is with a quick story. So this is Shirley and her husband Keith. So Shirley uh, ran a, and owned a, a preschool and she had two locations when we first met her. Now the two locations that she had were very, very successful when we met her. But they were successful because Shirley was the leader. <laughs> she worked 90 to 100 hours a week. Um, and she was stressed out of her gourd. Stressed out of her gourd. Um, she was the main executive. They, they, you know, we'll call that director of both schools. And she was running back and forth between the two. And then as she started to apply some of the stuff to grow her business, they actually opened up a third location. So now she's running back and forth between the three. And finally, we had to have a real heart to heart with her as a coach and say, look, Shirley, you built out some systems, but the place that for you, you're still the main leader of all the schools. You know, we've, we've got to have you groom and develop your actual um, leaders at each of the three sites. And what's eventually planned for the day that you have a regional leader who's in charge of all three. And then how do we have backups for the leader at each site so that if someone were to get ill, or need to be gone for a period of time, that it doesn't devolve back just on you. And so it took over the course of about three and a half, four years she did this. And the result from that part was pretty cool. And I just want to share this kind of in her story from this part. This is her and us doing a, a we were at one of our business events for coaching clients. Um, she's there sharing and, and with some of the other coaching clients. And she was just so happy she had shared that this is the point where she had built that business to be. It wasn't level three, it was advanced stage level two, but it had been rooted on 90 hours, she had reduced her working hours to 50 per week and was taking off six or more weeks of actual vacation time. This was night and day. Look, some of you, you only work 40 or 50 hours. Wonderful. And so your goal is to reduce that down to 10 or 20. Some of you work 90 hours like Shirley and you want to reduce that down to a livable 40 or 50. You would be thrilled with that. So she reduced her working hours essentially in half. Um, and take off probably four times more time off. My point I'm trying to share with this is, the big part is she had to get leadership from just her hands to start trusting other people with leadership. Sometimes that's looking at the people you currently have and giving more to them, ownership like we talked about, of functional responsibilities and area of the business. Sometimes that's bringing somebody in from the outside. And I will make the comment that sometimes in a business we think, oh, I should just promote people that I have. And you, you have, I'm going to take this example here of April, and you've got Joe, and you've got uh, Tim. That's a time, Tim. All right, so what you might discover is that April, for her, you giving her more responsibility, that's a good fit. She's very capable of handling that. And Joe, if you were to give him more responsibility, what you might discover is that, quite frankly, he's not the right person for that. And it's too much for him. He, he really is, he was better in the existing role that he had. You promoted him into a role that he's not going to be successful in. And then in our other example here, you have Tim, who is, in fact, successful in that new role. But then as the business goes, two or three years later, you might discover that April, as you promote her to the next level, she's no longer very good at that part. And what you might discover is that Tim is okay at it, but not great. He was great in his earlier role, but as the company developed, you actually needed someone more capable than him playing that new role. 
So as you think about this leadership uh, bottleneck, and we start handing off areas of leadership, sometimes it's, you know, you have a person internally that you can promote, and you give them that responsibility. Sometimes that would be the greatest mistake, and you really should be looking for somebody from the outside to come in, because that outside person is going to have more capability of what you need. So on the leadership paradox, think about who you have and be really honest. Just because they've been with you doesn't mean they're going to be successful in that new role. Maybe leaving them in their existing role and bringing somebody new in could be the best thing to do. But you'll be smart about it. You'll be intelligent as you do that. So in Shirley's case, that was an example. She did have some of her um, school um, uh, staff that were able to make this jump with her. And some of her school staff, she had to bring in from the outside that, that they were great in their existing roles. And so let's leave them in the role that they're being successful in. Let's go to pitfall number four, the revenue paradox. Now, the revenue paradox is a company that says, David, all of this sounds great. I want to make my business less owner-reliant. I want to make my business more scalable. But I need my production, which means I just don't have time for me to be the one producing. You know, I don't have time to do this. And I just want to tell you that that's pure and unadulterated crap. <laughs> you do have time, right? Go back to episode two of the podcast. Look at the time value matrix and doing that. What did I talk before about how we take some of the expert level knowledge and push it down to an admin level for the things like scheduling, et cetera. So I guess the point I'm, I'm telling you is that you do have time, but it's not an either or. We gave the example of Tom for him looking at where his profit was coming from. And he discovered that half of his production was in surgeries doing procedures for payers that paid very little. And 20 to 25% were these much more profitable, four, five times more revenue for the same procedure. By reducing some of this to free up time to take on more of these better patients for him in that case, um, allowed him to scale production capacity at the same time, free up some of his time. So I want you to think about it with the analogy of have you ever... Have you ever moved like a, a bookcase or a refrigerator? You kind of have to wiggle one side. You lean it to one side and you put that leg forward. And then you lean it back the other way and put the other leg forward. And you kind of walk this, this refrigerator back into the space where it needs to go to fit into the hutch in your kitchen. It's not all of one, all of the other. It's a little bit more of this and a little bit more of that. This is how we go about it. So you're not going to stop doing production. If you need your revenue that you produce, whether you're directly working with a client or you're overseeing a staff that, that are the ones who are producing and you're needed in there right now, how can you find the places that you can free up 5, 10, 15% of your production time such that you can now invest it to higher value areas? So a couple of examples. You might be involved working with clients and your clients might be you know, I, I, I like to look at it this way. You might have, if I look at your clients, A, B, and C level clients, you might have 50% of your clients are C level clients. That was the example for Tom I gave earlier. And you might have, you know, in his case, it was 20 to 25% of his clients were your A level clients, which means that 25 to 30% were these middle ground clients. So what would I do? If I were your business coach, I would have us just take an hour to do this analysis, for example, breaking our clients or our revenue sources down by about how good are they from a profitability standpoint. And by looking at this, I'm going to tell you that the easy way to do that is let's, let's take and let go of and either fire or do a price increase for 10 to 20 percent. And if I can't make them a B client, I let go. And that now frees up. Let's say I get, you know, 10% more of B-level clients from that, and now I lose 10% of this business. Okay. So, and by the way, I'm using raw numbers. So technically 10% of 50% is 5%. What I'm intending to say here is out of this 50%, I keep 40 of it. Uh, probably I keep 30 of it. 10% I've made into B-level clients. 10% I've just let go. So I've freed up 10% capacity. in our example here, by taking, let's make it even clearer, we're taking 20% of the total business, which comes from these C-bucket clients. And I just either fired them or I gave them the opportunity to be a B-bucket client by raising their pricing. And usually what happens is, like for example, in any kind of services firm, your C-bucket clients are almost always, not always, but almost always, these are your earliest customers. 
These are the ones that, that came with you early on and they tend to be paying very low prices because you didn't raise prices along the way. They tend to have a lot of what I'll call scope creep, which means that you promise them X and Y, but they demand Z as well. So your, your gross profit margin was reduced even more. These are the ones that we need to let go of. Over time, I want to get rid of 100% of my C bucket clients. I want all of them gone. And either they're going to become A or B bucket clients or they're fired and I replace them with higher quality clients. And if I do this a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time, I do take on small risks that yes, I'm letting go of revenue, but generally speaking, that revenue I'm letting go is very small profit margin from a gross profit standpoint. Sometimes it's even a negative margin. One of the financial services firms we work with, their C bucket clients, they actually were losing money on. <laughs> and they were really hard on their staff, getting rid of them by either raising pricing to convert them to an A or B bucket or just firing them, increase their profitability immediately without even having anyone to backfill that space. And then of course, now that they have the space, they can go think about how do we find, do our marketing and sales processes to get more better clients in. So the revenue paradox says I, I'm so needed in production in some way. I need the revenue that I produce. I don't have time to do any of this work. The reality is a portion of the work that you're doing is low margin. The place we go initially, and again, this is from years of coaching companies, almost always there's a portion of what they're doing that if we focus in on that, we can find opportunities for them to get rid of low margin business, which frees up capacity and time to replace that with better margin stuff. Now you'd say, well, why don't all business owners know this? <laughs> and the sad truth is you were, you were taught to, to be an owner aligned business owner. You're taught to build a, a job. You were not taught to build a company. I mean, no one was, I wasn't initially, I had to figure this stuff out myself. It took me years to figure this stuff out. Probably the first six, seven, eight years of business, we were running around with our heads cut off like a chicken. And uh, we scaled based on our personal production. Matter of fact, my business partner and I at that time, we scaled our company um, from a few hundred thousand in revenue to about three-ish million a year in revenue. And most of that production was us. But to go from three, to, you know, to go from that two, three million point to the next stage, which for us was six to seven million, we had to go beyond that. And that was the, the reality that was forced upon us. The same is true. You weren't taught to build a business. Probably you were taught to make a job. And so let's accept that and then say, because of that, my reflexive thinking, my default settings are to make this, depend this business more and more dependent on me. And so I have to get inputs, whether it be a podcast like this or a book like Scale or something else, to retrain my brain, work with a coach, et cetera, so that I can start to look and make decisions in the business to build it independent of me. And that is extraordinarily important. And so I want to go here and I'm just going to share one last story about this. So the last story that I want to share has to do with the pitfall number five, which is the identity crisis. Actually, I'll share two stories on this one here, the identity crisis. I promised this earlier and I want to make sure that I'm doing this. So um, the identity crisis comes when we don't realize it, but we've identified us with the business. And the truth of the matter is you're not your business. You're not, you are a separate, distinct individual. You have value and merit independent of the business. But I'll speak from personal experience. Um, I, especially younger on, um, I was in my thirties and in my forties, I took a great deal of my self image was me as a successful business person. And for example, I remember I was 35 and I sold my, my first exit. I sold a company, you know, made several million dollars from that sale. And I remember, um, how empty I felt. Like I would go meet people and a social function and they say, well, what do you do? And I would like, I don't know. I sold the business. What am I without the business? And you can laugh at that. But then fast forward, even as I've been working on this years later. So here I am with the Maui companies. Um, I started about three years ago, taking the entire summer off. I typically take about five months off now because we've grown our business to that transition between advanced stage level two and level three. We're right in that transition point. You know, I can leave the business for two, three, four months at a pop, but if I'm not there beyond there, the business will start to, to slow down its growth. And, and, and so it still needs me in some respect, but I go away for the summer. The first summer I took off was horrible. Why? You know, I spent time with my family and I loved it. I spent time with my wife and I loved it, 
but they only wanted to spend a little bit of time together. I had all this empty time and I didn't know what to do with myself. Like if I'm not doing the business, which I really enjoy, who am I without the business? Yes, my kids wanted to spend time and we, we went camping, we went hiking, we did all kinds of fun stuff. I could take my wife on trips or a date here or there. We enjoyed family meals. But what about the other 12 hours in the day? Right? I just, I missed it. I didn't have something else there. And I realized that too much of my life was business focused. And so in the last three years I've worked on how do I create hobbies for myself? How do I find life beyond that? Now, coming back to this, how does this affect you as a business owner? Your identity too closely as the business hurts you because that creates owner reliances. You don't realize it, but it does. And I want to share an example. This is a story. This is Tom's. Uh, Tom was a client of ours for probably about eight, nine years before he eventually exited his business as a level three business owner. And one of the cool parts for it was he shared the story in his business where he made the announcement in 2014 about retiring and he made the announcement to his entire company. And I thought, wow, this is really quite cool. Um, but Tom struggled for years to let go. Now, first of all, when we met him, he was working 78 hours a week. Matter of fact, he didn't even want to come to his very first Maui event. He didn't want to have anything to do with Maui. He just wanted to run his business, which um, was a wholesaling company. His wife actually bought his ticket to the event and made his travel arrangements and said, you're going to go. Why? Because him working 70 to 80 hours obsessing about the business meant he was just not present in their family's life. They had two kids and he, he wasn't there as much as he really, when in retrospect, wished he would have been there. You know, he's doing well. It was a $5 million a year company, making over a million dollars of personal income. But here's the cool part. Doing this work over the course of the next eight-ish years, he scaled that company 4x to a revenue of over 20 million. At the same time, he increased his profitability. He was making millions of dollars and he reduced the reliance on him down to where he was working 10 hours a week. Um, and what was the biggest difference? What, what was the switch that, that had to happen for him? It was somewhere at about the second-ish year of us working together when finally he heard from, from through the coaching concept of he just needs to recognize that he is not his business. He had wrapped so much of his emotional life into the business, it was hard for him to let it go. He didn't even see all the places. Like He would say that, David, my office, like this is in years retrospect. I, 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 I still see him at events from time to time. And he was sharing that he used to have his office right there in the center so he could be there checking every order being shipped. You know, this is when he's now growing to seven, eight, ten million dollars a year. He's going there to check people who are shipping products. Not what he should be doing. He's got staff who are quite capable of doing this. But fast forward, somewhere about the third year in there, his office was now in a small little section of his building where he had his warehouse. It was away from everybody else. He was no longer the spider at the center of a web where everything ran back through him, which he used to love that because it helped him feel important. What he recognized is he wanted the business to be successful more than he wanted um, him to necessarily feel the important. Early on, he wanted to be that important person where everything led back to him. He wanted all that control. But when he really saw it objectively and recognized he had hyper-identified with his business, and he could step away from that emotionally, he started to realize that he is not his business, so he could step out of that and say, hey, I don't care if I'm the one doing these things. I just want the business to be sure and protected that the right things are happening in the right way. And by hiring good people, building our internal controls, um, processing things through, training our staff, having good leaders in place, I can be assured that as our business grows, the right things are happening in the right way at the right time to generate the right result without it being so reliant on him. So these are all examples of not over-identifying. Remember, there's going to be a day that you're going to have a decision to make, which is, is it more important for you to feel important running everything in the business? Or is it more important for you to remove yourself from those areas of the business that you don't add the most value so that the business can scale and grow? At the core, owner reliances are caused by things like uh, controlling, controlitis. Over-identifying with the business then leads to controlitis, which leads to an owner-reliant company. So here you've had various ideas on how five main ones about how you can escape those owner-reliance pitfalls. And I've got one more comment since we just talked about this, which is one last coaching. Um, perhaps you don't want to retire. 
<laughs> you know, when I think about it, the idea of completely retiring from my business, that's not what I want to do. I love the idea of taking you know, half the year off and working half the year roughly. That to me is exciting. I don't want to be working more than 35, 40 hours a week. But I do want to have a contribution through the business. It's a source of engagement. It's a source of pride. It's a source of having impact and service to the world. And it is a source of feeling like I'm winning the game by having it grow and be prosperous. Those are things for me. What are your reasons? But maybe selling your company is not what you want to do. Um, I'll probably talk about that in a future podcast at some point. There's a certain question set to go through. We take clients here all the time. Should you keep the business or should you sell it? But my comment for you is, is that the only exit doesn't have to be to sell. I know many business owners who've sold their company are happy, happy, happy. And I've had many other clients who've sold their company and they say, David, I wish I hadn't sold. It was growing really well. The role I was doing, I loved. I had plenty of time off. I enjoyed the work that I got to do. And quite frankly, if I had kept it for another five or 10 years, it would have been worth five to 10 times more money. Well, you can think about that yourself. That's the last thought that I'll leave you with today. I hope you enjoyed the episode.